assalamu alaikum and uh, a very good morning to all our panelists as well as the other speakers on this very important 2021 Malaysia Economic Strategic and Outlook Forum. I also would like to welcome those who are on Zoom link with us, as well as following us on the Facebook and the other media uh, portals. As uh, mentioned earlier by the three speakers, Tan Sri Michael, uh, Azrani, and then, of course, uh, His Excellency, the Minister, Alexander Nanta Lingi. Uh, the perspective of the COVID impact is very, very, I would say, drastic, uh, not only in Malaysia, but all over the world. And for more than one whole year, although there is a little bit of a dispute between when did this all start, uh, maybe in 2019, because the COVID-19 is actually the year in which the COVID was discovered and creating this problem. So the whole of 2020 has been sort of uh, problematic and uh, worldwide, the economy has been brought down to its knees so to speak. And in 2021, there is some light in the horizon or in the, at the end of the tunnel. And we are seeing what would be the post-COVID economic outlook. As uh, pointed out by both uh, Tansri Michael and Azrani, and the minister brought out what Malaysian government is doing in order to bring the sustainability issue in our economy. I would like to take a, a, not a pessimistic outlook. When we talk about the post-COVID, it means that COVID is over and therefore we are moving into a different kind of uh, a period. Uh, but I think that COVID is not just going to go away in 2021 or even 2022, it will be present, but the impact is likely to be much, much lower because of things that have been happening, as was rightly pointed out by the issues of, of uh, any, uh, what you call efforts that is made by Malaysian government and governments all over the world, including the West and the US, on what we call the stimulus packages and other things, just to sustain the economy and get on with it. So the post-COVID economic outlook, whether it is a COVID uh, normal, new normal, or post-COVID new normal, I'm not too sure, but we have four distinguished speakers to present us with their views and how they look forward in 2021, both in terms of the global trend, as well as what is Malaysia coping with. Uh, I would like to take the order in which Zain mentioned the names, Mr. Richard Record, uh, lead economist, macroeconomics, trade and investment of the World Bank. And of course, he is based in Malaysia and he would like to bring in the perspective the global perspective, as well as how the Malaysian government is not reacting to it, uh, rebooting it and revitalize it uh, as the phrases go. And second is of course a very important uh, person, that was really Dr. Mohammad Uzid Mahideen, uh, Chief Statistician, Department of Statistics Malaysia. He is the custodian of the data and how the trends are moving, and therefore we would be able to get some kind of an insight into what is happening, but whether what the statistics say is actually the ground facts or the ground feelings. We are not so sure if these two jive together. And of course, Firdaus Rosli, Senior Economist, Malaysian 
stretching cooperation, Brahad, he will look at the corporate side of things and what is happening in the corporate front and whether the sort of mergers, acquisitions, takeovers, and other things, exercises are really taking place. And the standing of some of the corporations in relation to the one year or so impact that the COVID has brought about. And finally, Mr. Shan Said, Chief Economics of IQ, Juawai IQ, would be able to give his perspective. With that, um, once again, thank you very much for inviting me to be the moderator. I think uh, Zai uh, would be able to control the timing. And from, we are now 10, we are supposed to start at 9.45, but it is just past 10. And he will have eight minutes of presentation and then we move on. And then we take on some questions and answers at the end of the panel. With that introduction, can I ask Mr. Richard Record to give us your views on this matter? Richard? Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sri, and uh, good morning to everyone uh, connected. Um, it's very nice to be back at the Strategic Outlook Forum. Um, I actually uh, was also honored to, to take part in a similar panel two years ago. Um, of course, that was a, a very different world um, before COVID. Um, and where, of course, we were all uh, um, at that time uh, present in the, the Hotel Istana for the event. So let me, uh, let me share my screen now so you can see a few slides. I'm going to share a little bit of content um, from our, our work in the World Bank on, on the economic outlook. Um, I hope you can all see it now. Um, just a few slides. Um, I have the very uh, the unenviable position of speaking before uh, Dato Sri Dr. Uzir, who, of course, has his finger on the numbers. Uh, better than anyone in Malaysia, but let me try my best and, and share a, um, a few thoughts on, on how we see, see the economic outlook. So I think I was going to make sort of four, four main points, if you like, on, on, on the uh, future direction of Malaysia's economy. And, and of course, looking back a little bit um, to chart out how we see the, the post-COVID recovery. Um, I think the first point is that, um, you know, this, this crisis has developed a whole new lexicon for economists. Um, um, about nine months ago, we were wondering, is this going to be a V-shaped recovery? Um, that didn't really materialize. We started worrying about, is it going to be a U-shaped recovery uh, with a, a longer period of, of, of recession? Um, we talked about an L-shaped recovery. Will there ever be a recovery, a W-shaped recovery, up and down, second wave, et cetera? Um, I think one of the biggest concerns we have now is what we talk about a K-shaped recovery. Um, and in many ways, we're already experiencing some of that in Malaysia, essentially a sort of dual economy where we see continued repressed domestic demand, essentially the services sector, while perhaps encouragingly, we're seeing sort of a, something of a rebound in external demand, particularly driven by China's own recovery, which is sort of sucking in Malaysia's manufactured exports. And in fact, we're, also, we're seeing quite encouraging numbers on that part of the economy. So the question is, what does that mean for public policy? Um, how can we sort of continue to, to facilitate a strong rebound on those parts of the economy that will bounce back first um, and help uh, an adjustment and a recovery in those other parts of the economy that might see a slower rebound. Secondly, of course, we've seen an enormous widening of the fiscal deficit. That's everywhere around the world. Um, of course, governments exist for counter-cyclical fiscal policy. We, we, we shouldn't be surprised that that happens. Malaysia is in the fortunate position that it has deeper fiscal resources than many other developing economies and so has been able to respond uh, and execute a large fiscal stimulus to, to help blunt the impact of the crisis. Inevitably, of course, revenue has fall fallen. And so the question is, you know, how does, how does the government sort of start to normalize um, that fiscal position as the recovery takes hold? Looking forward a little bit more, of course, we, we do expect global growth to rebound in 2021. I'll share some of our numbers on that very soon. Um, and we expect, of course, to see Malaysia's economy return to growth um, and hopefully including you know, something of a, a bounce back from, from last year's recession. Um, but clearly the risks are very heavily, heavily tilted to the downside. And perhaps the, the risk of course, is that we see that recovery, you know, only taking hold at some point later on in the year, rather than as early as, as, early as might be hoped. Um, near term policies, I think the, the focus is on containing the output and protecting the most vulnerable. And then, as I mentioned, facilitating the, the recovery of, uh, of fiscal balances. 
So I'm going to talk very, uh, very briefly about the numbers here. I won't, won't spend too much time. Um, Dr. Ozir, of course, <laughs> mentioned is, is the one certainly on top of these much more than I am. Um, but that just puts in perspective, we, we've seen uh, something of a, a sort of partial rebound in Q3 in terms of global, global economy. Um, essentially, economy is contracting less in the third quarter. The sharpest sort of part of the, the impact was in the second quarter. Um, but we're still, uh, still some way to go. And uh, we've seen, a, I think, a, a sort of slowdown in that pace of recovery into the fourth quarter as well. Essentially, um, those economies which are more open trade manufacturing oriented have seen a, something of a, a bounce back in relatively greater terms, particularly in East Asia. Um, those economies which are where the pandemic has been raging deepest, particularly in Western Europe, North America, um, and which are more services oriented have continued to see a, a sharp contraction over the third and fourth quarters. Um, I think we're all quite familiar with the numbers for Malaysia. The pattern is quite similar. Um, as an economist, I've never generated a chart showing growth that goes all the way down to negative 20%. Um, that's what we saw almost in the second quarter of last year. Um, you know, something of a bounce back in the third quarter, um, a slightly uh, deeper contraction in the fourth quarter. Um, encouragingly, we've seen net exports now swinging into positive territory for Malaysia in the third and fourth quarters this year, um, but still significant weakness in consumption uh, and investment, reflecting the uncertainty um, and, of course, also the uh, uncertainty um, and also uh, reflecting, of course, uh, the continued pandemic restrictions. Um, on the external side, we continue to see um, uh, Perhaps an, an interesting pattern where Malaysia's goods exports are performing quite quite strongly, um, and uh, services are, and that's sort of contributing to an expansion in the, the current account balance. Um, essentially, Malaysia's goods exports performing quite well, um, but we're seeing a weakness in imports driven by weak consumption and weak investment. So, in many ways, that's a sort of false dawn. Um, although, of course, Malaysia is in the very fortunate position to have a, a current account surplus at a time when we're seeing economic conditions under stress everywhere. Um, and of course, perhaps uh, we're also seeing, again, with a slowdown in economic activity, an increase in unemployment and an increase in underemployment. So many Malaysians, of course, having to step out of the labor force or working fewer hours than that they might prefer to, at, uh, you know, given other conditions. Otherwise, of course, we always worry that unemployment affects the youth more so um, than, than other, other participants in the labor force, particularly those who are entering the employment market for the first time. Uh, and some of the concerns we have is that leads to sort of longer term scarring and the buildup of skills from, from those who need it. Um, very quickly, in my last slide, sort of looking back, of course, we've seen this increase in public expenditure in response to the crisis, slowdown in revenues and, a, and an increase in the fiscal deficit. Um, I think the question we all have is, you know, at what pace is that deficit able to be unwound um, so that the government can start sort of rebuilding fiscal buffers for the next crisis? Um, these numbers are perhaps you know, consistent with what we've seen in many countries around the world. And of course, Malaysia has been able to respond on a much larger scale um, than, than other emerging market economies. In fact, Malaysia's total response, around 20% sort of, of GDP in both fiscal and non-fiscal measures, puts it comfortably among advanced economies in terms of uh, scale of response. So looking forward, how do we, how do we see the sort of outlook um, in 2021? Um, we are projecting a sort of return to, to reasonably strong positive growth in, in most economies. Of course, that contrasts with 2020, when by our estimate, some 95% of the world's economies experienced a contraction. Um, you know, we haven't seen anything on that for 50 plus years um, for that kind of synchronized slowdown in economic activity. Um, if I go to the, the, the numbers on this latest slide, which is our latest uh, projections just released a couple of weeks ago. So we're projecting Global growth at around 4% um, this year. Um, that's sort of stronger than trend rates, refl uh, rates reflecting a bounce back and, and a base effect. Um, the strongest sort of regional pattern is in East Asia Pacific, um, which of course includes Malaysia. Um, and of course, it also includes China, um, which essentially props up those numbers. In fact, China is the only reason why East Asia and Pacific as a region as a whole saw positive growth in 2020. If you take China out, that was consistent with other parts of the world and a, and a contraction. Um, for Malaysia, um, we, we sort of predict a range um, for, for economic growth this year between uh, a sort of base, base projection um, of 6.7% and a lowercase scenario of 5.6%. Um, and essentially, the, the sort of 
biggest factor there is the, the pace and deployment of vaccines, both in Malaysia and among Malaysia's trading partners. So the sort of baseline scenario is that we see vaccine deployment effective and, and mostly completed within 2021 in most advanced economies. And that stimulates a sort of strong recovery in demand, including for Malaysia's tradables, as well as stronger commodity prices, which helps uh, Malaysia's oil and gas sectors, as well as the fiscal position, um, and uh, uh, sort of sustained progress on vaccine deployment within Malaysia that allows for a recovery in domestic consumption um, and conditional on both of those two factors, a recovery in investment. Um, anything that sees a slower pace of deployment um, both abroad, affecting Malaysia's tradables and commodity prices, and, and here at home, um, would of course lead us towards a, a lower case scenario and a slower pace of recovery. Um, of course, with any forecast, there's enormous um, uncertainty, especially now, and a number of sort of downside risks that I would highlight. As I mentioned, the first one, of course, is uh, any, anything that would cause a delay or a, a slow sort of pace of implementation of the vaccine deployment. So far, I think the signs are very good. The, uh, you know, Malaysia has been able to um, complete uh, con con contracting with major vaccine suppliers and employing a portfolio approach, which seems to be the best way to go from other countries around the world. Um, that augurs well. Um, but of course, we've seen, particularly in Europe, that it's not easy to roll these things out um, on, a time, on a timely basis. Um, there's often uncertainty or delayed delivery from manufacturers. Um, so that's something to work out on, uh, to work out and keep a lookout for. Um, secondly, containment, uh, anything that would lead, of course, to uh, the reimposition of a, another MCO, tighter conditions, um, will have a significant impact on consumption. Of course, consumption is the largest part of Malaysia's um, economic activity, over 60%. Um, and of course, that has a knock-on effect on investment again. Um, so the challenge, of course, is you know, sort of efficient and rapid rollout of the vaccine and continued smart containment in the meantime through non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, thirdly, anything that sort of leads, particularly on, given this, this, the risk of a, a K-shaped re recovery, anything that leads to continued uncertainty over vulnerable households um, is likely to lead to sort of continued pressure on, on both uh, businesses' employment and the need for a public sector response. Fourthly, and I think that was mentioned uh, by our, our moderator before, um, the big question that's affecting Malaysia more so, I would say, than a number of other emerging market economies is domestic political uncertainty. Um, the, the reality is we, we are seeing that's having an impact on investment. Um, essentially, a significant share of the private sector, including, I would say, particularly the foreign private sector, is, you know, sort of in many cases, sort of waiting to see what happens. Um, so we have many sources of uncertainty, not least, of course, the pandemic, um, uh, the number of controls, uh, restrictions on movement, restrictions on travel, um, but uncertainty on the political direction of, of the country has an impact as well. Finally, of course, there is an upside risk, um, we could, meaning that we could see growth faster than expected, um, and that could result from primarily um, more, you know, continued effective containment, um, rapid rollout, and a sort of stronger recovery among trading partners could have lead to a stronger rate of growth. That's an sort of upside risk as well. Um, I've just got two more slides. Um, I'd just like to make a couple of points on what we think the sort of key policy priorities are in the short term. Um, I mentioned, of course, the importance of continuing to suppress the pandemic through non-pharmaceutical interventions that needs to be continued to be coupled with vaccine deployment to ensure a, a resumption of domestic economic activity. Um, I think there is a, a continued likely need for additional targeted social spending through further packages from the government. As I mentioned before, we know some parts of the economy are, are bouncing back to life already. Um, other parts will hopefully bounce back soon, but some parts will continue to take time um, and so there's an important role for the public sector to sort of shift from counter cyclical economic policies at a home to, as a whole, to economic policies that provide targeted support to those parts of the economy that will need to, to, to see adjustment or will see a slower pace of recovery. And then finally, and perhaps this is the most important one, and I think the YB Minister's remarks alluded to it as well, is, uh, is sort of facilitating growth, new growth in a, in a post-pandemic environment or, or what everyone talks to, about as the sort of the new normal. Um, maybe sort of three things I'd highlight there. And I think in all of these areas, Malaysia has both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, the first one is skills. And in many ways, Malaysia is well-placed. Um, you know, the, the sort of the underlying skills of the population is very strong when we compare with sort of regional comparators. But we also know that this is an area under pressure. And consistently, when we ask private sector investors, both within Malaysia and looking to come into Malaysia, 
they raise concerns about the sort of gap between the types of skills that they're looking for uh, and the availability of those skills in, in the workforce. Um, and essentially, this is sort of the, the transition um, which is occurring from a workforce which sort of is able to meet the sort of requirements of, uh, of today around sort of numeracy and literacy and what we see the requirements of tomorrow around new types of skills, digital literacy, socio-emotional skills, problem-solving skills, um, and that's an area where I think Malaysia's sort of educational institutions are, are still adjusting. Second is digital, and again, the minister mentioned this. Um, Malaysia has a wonderful opportunity in that this is one of the most digitally connected populations on the planet. Um, that's basically the sort of, you know, the, the, the fuel on, the, on which the digital economy runs. But the, the challenge is that we see that Malaysian businesses have been relatively slow to adopt digital technologies. Um, and that sort of, you know, that, that's when you set aside the rock star firms, we all know about Grab, Fave, and those sort of e-commerce uh, successes. But if you look down the, the sort of long tail of the private sector, um, we see not all have been adopting as fast and uh, as, as quickly as, as might be desirable. And then finally, the area I highlight is productivity. Um, we just completed a, a large study on this and we found two interesting findings. One is that Malay, you know, the aggregate level of productivity or efficiency in Malaysia is you know, higher than in regional comparators, but still perhaps unsurprisingly short of high income and developed economies that Malaysia aspires to join. But most interestingly, we find that dispersion of productivity in Malaysia is incredibly wide, much wider than almost any comparator economy. What does that mean? It means that the best performing firms in Malaysia are at the global frontier. So the most efficient firms in Malaysia are the most efficient anywhere. And that's you know, a fantastic opportunity. Um, but it also means that the bottom is very low. In fact, there's this very wide dispersion from the top performing firms to, to the, the lowest performing firms. Um, and suggests that maybe the challenge is not just trying to lift up the bottom, but also stimulating more competition in the economy, particularly those sectors where competition is, is relatively less intense um, to allow more efficient firms to grow a larger share of the market and therefore raise aggregate level efficiency across the economy as a, as a whole. Um, one final sort of point on, on fiscal. Um, I think, you know, we've seen, we're seeing this trend right across the world that governments have stretched their balance sheets to respond to COVID. Um, the question is, you know, how, you know, how, how do they sort of unwind some of that support and start rebuilding buffers for the next crisis? Um, and of course, the reality is, even before COVID came along, here in Malaysia, we were already talking about debt, about contingent liabilities, about the lack of space that the, the government had to support public expenditure going forward. Um, all of those pressures and challenges are now even larger, given that the sort of additional debt burden that's been built up over the last year um, to respond rightly so to the crisis. Yeah. And so there are a few areas that we perhaps highlight. Um, we would suggest that the challenge for Malaysia's government over the next few years is about both collecting more and spending better. Um, and certainly we think there's some scope to look at ways within the existing tax frameworks um, across personal income tax, consumption taxes, and maybe even new sources of taxation. The reality is if the government does nothing on revenue, the higher cost of debt service will need, will sort of enforce a requirement to cut expenditure. Um, and uh, you know, relative, in relative terms, we see that Malaysia's government collects around 15% of GDP um, the only major economy that collects less is Indonesia, and that's not, frankly, a, a great benchmark. Um, so the reality is, over the medium term, Malaysia's government will need to collect more revenue. Um, equally, we'll need to think a little bit more carefully on the expenditure side, about how the wage bill and pensions can be, can be contained, um, how social spending might be better targeted. Uh, and frankly, you know, given that everyone around the world is talking about a green recovery, green growth, um, and in many cases looking at carbon taxation, um, maybe this really is time to start thinking about phasing out some of the, the generalized subsidies, including... Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, I think uh, you have given us uh, uh, a very positive outlook, so to speak, from uh, a very depressed 2020 into what I may say a hopeful 2021 uh, for Malaysia as well as for global perspective. And uh, if the global growth rate, as you rightly pointed out, is going to be at 4%, this would be for a Malaysian uh, trading uh, export-oriented economy would be very good for the recovery into your lower figure of 5.6 or a higher figure of 6.7. But this is...
risks uh, that are associated with it. And of course, the vaccine oriented risk uh, can be mitigated because we have taken the right steps. But the politics oriented risks are still heavy on the country. And hopefully, we will take note of it. And um, the vulnerable households, I think this is important because you have between the World Bank and uh, the Malaysian uh, statistical figures, uh, the vulnerable, the poverty line and things like that, there is a huge disparity. And uh, we have this uh, stimulus package targeted to the bottom 40 kind of a thing, and that is a huge number. So these are critical issues that we will have to look at as we go along. So with that now, I think uh, we will invite uh, Dato Sri Dr. Mohamed Uzid Maidi. Uh, I don't know whether you're going to respond to Richard's, uh, some of the figures, but then uh, we want the truth, uh, the plain facts and what they mean for the Malaysian economy projected into 2021 and beyond. Dr. Uzid. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and salam sejahtera. Thank you, uh, Datuk Seri. Uh, Excellency yang berhormat minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and all the other panelists. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate, congratulate to the organizer for having this forum, which is timely to review and assess how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the Malaysian economy in 2020. We are also glad to share some of the key economic findings to this forum as benchmark to look forward for the coming years. Uh, after we listen to Mr. Richard uh, on, the, on the global outlook, uh, now I would like to share uh, how uh, the strategic show in the context of the, um, uh, the country on the context of Malaysia. Uh, that's three, I prepared some slide here, uh, about uh, nine slide. Uh, I will cover among others on the uh, Malaysia economy uh, scenario. Uh, and also, I also keen to also put forward on the uh, demography perspective because we have to know uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have to so, so have to look at the, our demography on the aging society because at the moment we have about 2.3 million uh, population at the, at the age uh, 65 years old and older. Uh, about 77 percent of the total population. I will share also on the current statistic on labor scenario, on the international trade, and also uh, economy prospect uh, based on our uh, leading indicator. Next, please. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Malaysia has gone through several economy development phases, which involve the implementation of different economy and social policy according national uh, target. The most significant economy recession was recorded in 1998 when the Malaysian economy contracted 7.4% uh, following a sharp decline in gross peak capital formation and private final consumption expenditure as the main factor of the contraction. And on the supply side, all sector declined except for mining and quarry sector which recorded positive growth of 0.4%. Uh, the ASEAN financial crisis has led to the depreciation of currency, value of the stock market and value of asset in the economy. The recovery of Malaysian economy after the fi ASEAN financial crisis was achieved through the measure taken by the government such as capital contour, restructuring of the financial sector and economy stimulus package. Furthermore, our country has experienced another recession in 2009 due to the global financial crisis, which created pressure to the world financial demand and market. The Malaysian economy declined 1.5% in 2009, following a sharp decline in export and a decrease in gross peak capital formation as the main factor of the contraction. The process of the economy recovery was achieved through fiscal injection and the financial stimulus package, which has witnessed Malaysia GDP recover in 2010 at 7.4%. The COVID-19 pandemic, which started since December 29, 
2015 has caused a health and economic crisis. Malaysia was not exempted from the effect of this pandemic when the economy descended 5.6% in 2020. This is the second lowest contraction after the economy recession in 1998. This economic crisis is different from the previous, the previous crisis as it affected supply and demand disruption domestically and globally. All main economic sectors recorded negative growth, mainly contributed by services, construction, and mining and quarry sectors. And on demand side, all expenditure component decreased except government final consumption expenditure. The external sector subly fell due to the decline in export of services following the travel restriction, restriction of the foreign tourists. Domestic demand also fell following the contraction of private final consumption expenditure and gross peak capital formation. The economic recovery for this crisis will depend on the recovery of the health crisis and the economy stability. Next, uh, Malaysia economy structure uh, in 1998 was supported by the contribution of the services sector about 55.8%, followed by manufacturing sector 27.9% and agriculture sector 9.6%. Specifically, manufacturing sector declined sharply 13.4% in 2009 as a result of the declining demand from the export market. Meanwhile, the percentage share of the agriculture sector to GDP posted significant decline from 37.9% in 1960 to only 7.4% in 2020. As the COVID-19 pandemic brought new perspective on food security and job creation, this show that the need to revisit on agriculture sector by modernization investment in capital in terms of technologies and encourage young people to participate in the sector by adopting smart farming to boost uh, farmer income. The current pandemic also boosted the performance of digital economy following social distancing and movement restriction. restriction. The new norm by leveraging online and virtual platform are becoming important and this support the aspiration of Industrial Revolution 4.0. During the pandemic, many sectors are beginning to benefit from digital technology and infrastructure such as drone technology, robotic, mobile tracking, artificial intelligence, and Internet of Things. Given the performance of digital economy in 2018, Malaysia proved to be on track toward digital, digitalization when ICT contribution to the national economy grew by 6.9% in 2018 after regist registering a growth of 9.8% in the preceding year. ICT recorded a value of RM267.7 billion with a contribution of 18.5% in the GDP. The value added of e-commerce increased by RM 8.4 billion to RM 115.5 billion in 2018. Performance of e-commerce grew at 7.9% as compared to 11.9% in 2017. The contribution of e-commerce to GDP recorded 8.0%. Meanwhile, net export of ICT product recorded surplus of RM88.5 billion in 2018. Employment in the ICT industry increased to 1.12 million person with a growth of 2.6% as compared to 1.09 million person in 2017. Uh, I would like to highlight also here on the issue uh, what the SME businesses face. Uh, we can say here we, uh, SME businesses face four major challenging challenges during pandemic, which are number one, operation disruption, closure, shorter operation hours of non-essential businesses, cash flow problem, reduced in income, but committed to pay compulsory expenses, difficult access to stimulus package, packages, 
risk of bankruptcy and supply chain uh, disruption. Next, please. Now I will move on a little bit on the uh, put forward on the perspective on salaries and wages. Uh, based on the quarterly performance trend uh, prior to the pandemic, services in quarter one. 2020 posted positive growth as compared to the same quarter of the previous year. Starting quarter 2, 2020, the salary and wages recorded negative growth for the next three quarters with the highest contraction in quarter 2, 2020, in line with the implementation of MCO nationwide. Due to the implementation of the first phase of MCO in the second quarter 2020, salaries and wages paid in services sector were affected and recorded the lowest since 2019 which recorded RM 23.5 billion or negative 6.4% year on year. In the second quarter 2020, subsector related to tourism industry affected the most, which are transportation declined by 29.7%, accommodation declined by 26.3%, Art, entertainment, and recreation declined by 20.0%. Throughout the year 2020, services, salaries, and wages declined negative 3.1% as compared to increase 4.1% in 2019. In terms of performance of salary and wages in the manufacturing sector, since the implementation of the first phase of MCO in the second quarter 2020, has impacted the salary and wages paid in manufacturing sector down by 4.0% to RM 20.9 billion as compared to 3.4% in previous quarter. However, the salary wages paid improved to negative 2.7% and negative 1.2% in the third and the fourth quarter 2020 respectively. Sector that show improvement in terms of salary and wages in the fourth quarter were petroleum, chemical, rubber and plastic product, and electrical electronic product. Throughout the year, manufacturing salary and wages declined by 1.1% as compared to 2019. Now I move on on the, uh, uh, I touch on a little bit on the demography perspective. In the last uh, few decades, the development strategies undertaken by the government had direct implication on the growth of urban towns and population over the intercensual period 1970 to 2020. As a result of the urbanization, the urban population increased significantly from 28.4% in 1970 to 76.7% in 2020. In this current scenario, it is expected that the urban working population will experience income disruption following economic consequence of the pandemic. Most of them are working in vulnerable industries such as services, namely air transport and tourism related industry compared to rural communities which more focus on agriculture related activities. 69.7% of the working population were urban were in urban area. For the period 1970 to 2020, the percentage of youth population increased from 36.4% to 44.9%. The percentage of youth population until 1990s were higher in the rural compared to those in the urban. However, when the percentage of the urban areas exceeded rural area, areas in, 20, 20, in year 2000, the youth composition also changed. In 2020, there were 26.7 youth population in the urban area compared to 14.4% in the rural. In 2010 only, only 10.6% youth resided in rural area as compared to 34.3% in urban. The mean and median income for both area had increased significantly over time the mean income in both area grew more than 150 percent in 10 years period, 1999 to 2019. The mean income ratio for the urban and rural had reduced 
over time starting from 2002. And in 2019, each RN1 ringgit earned by rural household urban household urban, uh, earn RN1.73. Now I move on on the labor uh, scenario. Ladies and gentlemen, throughout the year of 2020, based on the quarterly average dat data, Malaysia Labor Participant Rate, LFPR, in 2020, aged down to record 68.4% as compared to 2019, which was 68.7%. The number of employed persons decreased by 0.2% to 15.1 million percent due to the uncertainty in the labor market following the health and economic crisis during the year. During the year, 61.0% of them concentrated in services sector and followed by manufacturing sector at 16.9% share. All sectors recorded a decrease in number of employment except for services sector. As the country experienced a slow, slower labor demand in 2020 due to the adverse impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the annual unemployment rate spiked to 4.5 percent, the highest since 1993, with the number of unemployed persons rose to 711,000 persons as compared to the average of 500,000 persons in the period of 2016 to 2019. A comprehensive understanding of the labor market require analy analyzing additional indicators alongside the unemployment rate, namely time-related underemployment and scale-related underemployment. For the underemployment situation in the fourth quarter of 2020, there were 533.7 thousand persons who work less than 30 hours per week due to working condition or insufficient work. Out of this total, 369.1 thousand person were category as time-related underemployment since they work, less, they work less than 30 hours a week and they were able and willing to work extra hours. This group comprised of 2.4% of the overall employment in the fourth quarter of 2020. As observed for the time series of quarter one 2019 to quarter four 2020, the rate has increased almost double from average of 1.5% to 2.4% in 2019 to an average of 2.4% in 2020. In, in the meantime, the skill-related underemployment, which comprises of those with tertiary education, but working in smith skill and low skill occupation, amounted for 1.89 million person or 37.4% 37 of the total employed person with tertiary education. When analyzing the rate trends, is indicating that skill related underemployment is uh, employment structure issues in this country. On the labor mobility, as we are aware, the pandemic has affected the workers in many ways. In Malaysia, majority remain employed with no change in hours work, while some of them experience reduction or increase in hours work. In addition, there were some of them may have lost employment and become unemployed while there was a group a group of workers that lose employment and move outside labor force. According to OECD, job mobility is essential for a well-functioning market economy and for individual workers to boost their wages. Thus, we observe more labor mobility in the circle of services sector or within its subsector. Meanwhile, based on ILO, during the pandemic, many women lost their job, especially in airline industry, retail and accommodation and food services activities, since the economic activity were no longer able to operate as usual during MCO. The closure of childcare center during pandemic and healthcare issue also contributed to the factor they might take a break in seeking job 
for family reason. Hence, there was an increase of 3.0% of outside labor force in 2020. Next, please. On the international trade, ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia current account balance recorded RM62.1 billion in 2020, the highest surplus since 2011. The annual highest supply was steered by favorable performance of goods. Next export of goods for 2020 recorded at RM139.1 billion. The export of goods recorded RM778.2 billion, mainly in electrical and electronic, rubber and palm oil based product. Meanwhile, imports of goods posted RM639.1 billion primarily in electrical and electronic product. The main destination for both export and import were China, Singapore, and USA. As for services, it's registered a higher deficit at RN 48.0 billion in 2020, mainly attributed to travel, transport, and telecommunication, computer and information services. As the bigger contributor to services account, travel recorded a higher deficit of RM 7.8 billion for the first time in 30 years as a repercussion of the border closure and travel restriction in order to curb the spread of COVID-19 virus. For quite some time, our services structure has remained same and we have relied too long on travel. Perhaps time to review on services export to ensure the sustainability of current account balance. For the year 2020, uh, foreign direct investment FDI show a net inflow of RM 30.9 billion as again RM 31.7 billion. Although the FDI flow decreased, the FDI position shares by RM 14.4 billion to record RM 703.5 billion in 2020. FDI on high technologies, capital intensive industry should be the way forward. Quality investment should be the direction that leads to multiplier effect. Malaysia openness is perceived by the leap in ranking in the world trade from being the 43rd largest exporting nation in 1980 to 25th place in 1990 and, and 20th, 20th place in 2007. In 2020, Malaysia trade openness accounted for 125.6% of GDP, which export of good drove the economy, particularly in electrical and electronic rubber and palm oil based product. With a raise, its economy would inevitably be affected by the weak global demand. However, the recovery and stronger growth in major trading countries such as US and China, we also help to boost the export of goods. Thus, we drive a better economy performance in the future. Being an open economy, Malaysia be able to sustain its continuous current account surplus strength in export of goods and manufacturing sector, which also recorded positive growth precisely in export-oriented product. An open economy provides the platform to be competitive and this leads to higher oh. productivity. Finally, on the economy prospect, the composite leading indicator is a combination of the selected economy indicators that provide an advanced signal on the economy direction in average of four to six months ahead. Malaysia economy is expected to continue in the recovery trajectory in the first and the second quarter of 2021, when the composite leading indicator for November 2020 recorded 109.1 point up 7.1 percent from November 2019. Simultaneously, the more the month chain in LI also posted a growth of 0.4 percent in the sixth month, as again negative 0.7 percent in October 2020. Even though the living leading indicators show a better improvement, the re-implementation of MCO to strike a balance between health and the economy is posting uncertainty 
especially in term of the recovery momentum. The better performance of annual LI for November 2020 was mainly supported by Bursa Malaysia Industry Index driven by the healthcare index as the main contributor. And in the meantime, the increase in terms of month on month growth was primarily contributed by real import of semiconductors propelled by positive demand of the electronic integrated circuit. The performance of LI is in line with countries, namely Korea and China, whereby the direction of LI continue to increase, which indicate a better economic outlook despite confronting the pandemic crisis. Datuk Sri, sorry, we okay. need to wrap up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I thought that. Is, in view the selected economy uh, focus, I think uh, on the slide, uh, Datuk Sri, uh, I put forward uh, some of the uh, official focus uh, where uh, we use what uh, been uh, the government official focus from Ministry of Finance. Okay. So I think uh, that's all Datuk Sri. And also I have uh, to uh, highlight that uh, uh, this week, uh, the first uh, two uh, official economy uh, indicator will be released. That is on the inflation rate as well on uh, the export and import numbers for the referral month of January uh, okay. for, for this week. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uzair. I think uh, you have uh, very nicely captured the essence of the Malaysian economic platform from a historical perspective to a forecast in 2021. Although you delve quite a bit on the historical background, the most important thing that has come about from Richard's uh, contributions earlier is the vulnerable households. I think this urban rural migration and then the concentration of the people in the urban sector becomes a highly vulnerable kind of uh, a demographic group which has to be focused. And I think the stimulus package is actually trying to deal with. But what comes out from your presentation is that the economic fundamentals for Malaysia are still very strong. If we take the right moves, and also the projections are there, but without effort and depending on what we call the high fruits that are going to come, which is not going to happen, it is the low hanging fruits that we need to address in order to revive the growth in 2021. Thank you very much for that. I think we have a bit of a problem because of the time limit. And for Firdaus Rosli and Sean Said, I'm afraid that you might have to condense your presentation to because we have to close it at 11 o'clock, uh, although it is now, it is 50 past 10. But I would ask the organizers to give us another 10 minutes so that we can bring to a close by about 11.10 or so. If that is agreed, I would like to ask Firdaus Rosli to present his uh, points of view. Firdaus? Thank you, Dato Sri. Uh, it will be uh, quite a challenge for me to deliver a presentation in super speed uh, format, but uh, here goes. Okay, great. Um, so I'll probably take eight minutes. Um, uh, pretty much I uh, will touch on three things. Uh, number one is where are we now? Secondly, um, how did Malaysia fare in the past crisis, which um, has uh, been touched on by, um, uh, by the previous speaker, Dr. Sri um, And finally, I will wrap up with some reset, uh, future outlook for Malaysia. Okay. Um, let's try here, okay? Um, where are we now? Uh, I think uh, as far as um, um, the Malaysian economy is concerned um, and as well as to, uh, the world at large, uh, I think we have seen it all. Um, um, although um, um, uh, Richard has mentioned that um, you know, there will be a K-shape, which is very, um, very likely to be real, um, but we we um, projecting a somewhat V-shaped recovery and looking at the uh, economy as a, as a whole. Uh, so we, we think that the worst is over. Um, but um, we, we also per, uh, anticipate that lockdowns will be uh, deployed intermittently, if any, as we have seen um, in the last couple of weeks. 
Um, and and on the left, on the right side, um, uh, is is all about um, how costly lockdowns are, and uh, more so when borders are closed. Um, and then how we tackle the pandemic actually is as good as others around us. So you know, even though we managed to bring it down to a single digit level, it won't mean a thing um, if um, our neighboring countries and all around the region, as well as the world, are still uh, keeping their borders closed. So um, here's part two of my presentation. So uh, we, we need to take a look at how we are fair in past crisis. Uh, I would like to say this from a law of a bouncing ball kind of perspective. So if you take a ball with you and then you slam it down on the, uh, on, on the floor, uh, it, inevitably the uh, ball will bounce back. And this is pretty much what is uh, happening. And, and it is the uh, same scenario in past crisis as well. So we have seen this in, in, in the AFC, the global financial crisis, and the COVID pandemic um, is, is no different. We are projecting 5.6% um, um, growth in the, in the coming year, uh, which is slightly lower than uh, what we presented earlier, which was around 6.1. Um, if we look at the TFP, uh, we notice that um, Malaysia is quite susceptible to external, the external environment. So for as long as we, we are confronted with crisis, we will see that our, um, uh, our TFP, which is a total factor productivity, um, will inch lower a bit. And then we will continue to play catch up with, um, say, the United States as far as um, productivity is concerned. Uh, we see that the growth risk uh, will fade uh, with vaccine deployment. Uh, we've seen a couple of news reports yesterday. And, um, but somehow, um, vaccine alone will not become the whole panacea. Because if you look at the um, Google um, mobility report, we, we see that um, a, you know, quite a, a significant portion of our household are still living indoors and, and not moving outdoors even during the RMCO period. Um, on the right side is about the, the direct correlation between the number of tests and daily confirmed cases. This means that, you know, even though we have higher number of cases, it doesn't mean that um, infections are rising, it's just that the number of cases are rising, uh, it's, it's just that. Um, so we have to take, uh, take a note on that. Um, as far as our growth is concerned, if we were to look at um, in comparison with previous crisis, there's a somewhat a V kind of recovery, but that V may not be like a proper V that we saw in, in the previous crisis because of the re-emergence of um, rising cases and, uh, and, and the, in the intermittent uh, restrictions in terms of mobility, etc. So we think that it will be an even V. Um, as Richard said, it could be a W. And I can throw out a number of alphabets if you like as well. Uh, domestic demand will still drive inflation. Um, however, uh, as mentioned by a previous speaker, we think that unemployment will continue to remain high. Um, here's, here's where things get a bit uh, funny. Malaysia's credit rating has been quite consistent since 2004. And if we see in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, uh, crises, uh, we've seen how uh, our, our credit rating has gone up because of the debt to GDP ratio shrunk um, uh, widely over, over the late 80s and 90s. And um, in, in our case, um, we have seen uh, last month, I think, uh, two months ago, uh, where Fitch downgraded um, Malaysia's credit rating to triple B plus. And although SNP and Moody's are staying in, uh, uh, putting it on hold for the time being, but um, it, it it all depends on how the debt globally performs. So it does not necessarily mean that SMP and Moody's would downgrade us. It could also mean that, uh, that Fitch could, could upgrade it uh, back to, um, to, to where it was. Yeah. Labor market, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Jose just now, um, although we think that the, um, the, the rise in unemployment is something that we should take heed on, uh, because um, we have not seen this level since 1983, and um, and uh, it may pose political challenges for the government um, in the, in the coming phase uh, phases uh, quarters perhaps um, as we open up the economy and and if unemployment do not uh, go back to where it was or probably subside uh, you know um, uh, a bit we um, it, it may not be good. Uh, more so when we project inflation to rise progressively. 
we are speaking today at um, USD 63 per barrel um, of Brent crude oil price. And um, Mark is projecting a 2% inflation uh, this year on average. Um, but it remains to be seen on how the, the uh, inflation at the global stage will be translated uh, into, into the domestic economy. As far as monetary policy and ringgit is concerned, um, we have seen total rate cuts of 135 basis points last year. Um, we do not anticipate um, any further cuts this year, although uh, both um, a, a lot, quite a number of financial institutions are, are projecting another rate cut because of the prospect of growth and MCO 2.0, etc. But we, we think that the uh, Bank of Canada will hold the OPR throughout the year. Ringgit, there will be an upside to Ringgit uh, and uh, currently trading close to 4 Ringgit. 4.04 against the dollar, um, and we might think we, we think that it might go back to uh, the uh, minus one standard deviation in, in the coming um, weeks or months. To come. A future outlook. Um, so, uh, as as a credit rating agency, we look at things from a very long range perspective. Um, as mentioned, rightly pointed out by Dr. Jay just now, um, we are rapidly aging. What took France 115 years will only take us 25 years to reach from middle income economy to uh, uh, from where we are to an aging uh, aging nation status. So if we were to look back, work backwards, uh, we, we anticipate that by 2020, 2035, the uh, compensation of employees to GDP should be closer to 40% or more. And right now it is circulating around 35 to 6%. Um, so we still quite have quite a bit of work to do. So if we were to work backwards, um, 2021, it will be our inoculation drive. Um, and um, in, in the year's time, maybe half of the population will be, um, will be inoculated. Um, this taking into account um, that um, those below the age of 16 will not be um, subject to vaccination. Um, but um, in, in the year's time, it will be about 50%. Um, so there was still a little bit of room for us to, to grow as far as uh, inoculation drugs is concerned. So by 2023, there'll be GD15, both, I don't know, maybe it could be earlier, uh, but, but say if it were to stick to the five-year timeline, it will be GD15, and we think that GST will come in throughout that period, throughout the G, after the GD15, between GD15 to GD16 period, because um, there's a need for the government to normalize the economy, um, and, and, um, and make sure that uh, our revenue to GDP is, is um, being, um, uh, have, have a considerable buffer um, moving forward. So GE15, uh, GE16 is probably after GE16, I mean, after 2020, uh, 2028 will probably be our sprint period whereby that's probably where things are normalized, we are back to normal, um, but you know, notwithstanding any external shocks that, we, that may happen, uh, who knows? Um, but that would probably be the only time where we can sprint as how we saw in the 90s um, before we reach uh, 2025. Uh, that's, that's pretty much it for my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if time permits. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Fadaus, uh, for your presentation. And thank you very much for keeping up to the time. Uh, we are just past uh, 11 o'clock. I think... Um, your presentation reinforces the earlier sort of um, comfortable facts that uh, Richard brought out. Uh, and then based on the statistics, we now look at uh, nothing very seriously alarming. Debt to GDP, sovereign ratings, and rise in unemployment, uh, that's a factor for economic growth and control and inflation also is very much under some control. So looks like economic fundamentals are there and carry on. Um, make sure that the COVID doesn't turn into a very negative kind of a trend. With that, uh, Sean, uh, can you come in and quickly wrap up the whole thing from your perspective? I think probably you'll be taking a very generalized view and then impact on Malaysia. 
Thank you, Dadu Sir Iqbal. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, good morning and assalamu alaikum to everyone. Thank you, Tan Sir, Michael Leo and Jessica for having me in the show. I'll quickly uh, talk about the global economy and bring it down to Malaysia. Uh, we expect global macroeconomic to stay volatile and fragile. 2021 will be tougher than 2020. Uh, we expect policy response, especially from advanced economies like US, uh, Europe, Japan, to be very poor and that's why the COVID cases are higher in those economies as compared to uh, Asian economies. Markets continue to stay volatile. Last week alone, $58 billion were poured into the equity markets. And equity markets, generally, the market cap is $110 billion, which is 126% of the global uh, GDP. And we expect markets to continue to have excess liquidity, uh, courtesy central banks, Fed, ECB, and BOJ. And we expect a uh, market uh, to stay in a volatile zone. And if you pick up yesterday's Wall Street Journal, investors are not looking at the fundamentals of equities. They are just using the gut feelings. And there is, in the last one year, we have seen uh, there is an asset flip. Bonds have become equities and equities have become bonds. And nobody knows where the market is heading to when you have Bitcoin trading at 55,000 US uh, dollar. We expect US dollar to depreciate significantly by 20%. Last year, US dollar depreciated 16% against all the basket of currencies. This is a bigger risk for the global economy and exogenous factors will stay volatile. And we expect global economy to trade between one and 2%, not at a higher rate. Many people are throwing big numbers, but we expect uh, the exogenous factors are too, uh, too much that won't be able, the global economy won't be able uh, to handle those uh, uh, factors. The, the final thing, if we uh, see about global economy, the yield curve is st uh, stepping and it has gone up from 1.15 to 1.33. That clearly indicates that inflation is coming and the velocity of money that going up in advanced economy, that is an indication that we all are heading for a uh, stagflation. What is stagflation when you have higher inflation, lower growth and higher employment, especially in the advanced economies? Uh, if you pick up the latest report from UBS, it talks about emerging economies uh, will have a much better year as compared to uh, advanced economies. They have mentioned about Malaysia, Vietnam, Pakistan, uh, Peru, Singapore, and China. Bring it down to Malaysia. Uh, we expect uh, Malaysian economy, the macroeconomic stability uh, consolidates uh, the economic confidence. We expect uh, government to continue to maintain uh, macroeconomic stability. The government will continue to use expansionary fiscal policy. So the amalgamation of fiscal and monetary policy would drive uh, the growth for Malaysia uh, this year. Bank Negara has got sufficient room to maneuver between 1 and 1.75. Yes, the monetary uh, accommodation has got room uh, to spur growth. And we expect uh, Bank Negara to use tactical and strategic maneuvering to maintain structural stability of uh, uh, ringgit. Coming down to uh, uh, what Malaysian government has actually done, they are following the same strategy what the Chinese government has adopted last year. And if you pick up Economist magazine last August, the Chinese economy is using dual circulation strategy. What is dual circulation strategy? Support local businesses and encourage aggregate demand. That has been the key for Chinese economy in the last one year. Coming down to the key statistics for 2021, we expect Malaysia's GDP uh, between 3 and 4%. Oil prices between 50 and 70 dollars per barrel. I'm just quoting from uh, my newsletter in December. We said 50 and 70 dollars. Oil prices are up by 23 percent, and they are trading at 63 dollars. The budget was made at 40 dollars, so the government fiscal side of the balance sheet has got a lot of room uh, to consolidate. OPR rate will be between 1 and 1.75. We can expect 25 to 50 basis point cut. Uh, ringgit. Uh, to be trading between 3.67 and 4.10 because the premise is very simple. Uh, higher oil prices, US dollar depreciating by 20%, that will give boost to ringgit. Budget deficit between 6 and 7%. Commodities bull run is going to benefit Malaysia this year. And what nobody is talking about, my interview is there uh, two weeks back when I talk about LNG. Malaysia is a top five player in the LNG space. You have Qatar, Russia, Australia, Papua New Guinea, and Malaysia. So LNG is becoming big in this part of the world. So higher commodity prices, uh, higher uh, 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 the 
the overall positivity in the market will drive Malaysia uh, to the next level of growth and we expect uh, economy to recover by Q2 this year. I'm done. Okay, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, you have been very kind to wrap it up as quickly as possible. Uh, let me not try to wrap up. I think the pointers uh, from uh, Richards earlier is looking at the pragmatism in the global economy and a sort of a revival and what it means for Malaysia. And in terms of Dr. Datusri Uzair, uh, the Malaysian historical background and the progression that looks forward to, we have to strengthen it, whether by individual efforts or by sectoral group or by the government or all wrapped in together. But Tridaus came in, start looking at projections beyond 2021 into a little bit longer. My own feeling is that we can't predict, otherwise we become like soothsaying, you know, like uh, astrologers. And nothing has really happened in 2020. The COVID has brought about a new type of economics a scenario and how we predict the future. So hopefully we will have more stability in 2021. And with that strength, we will be able to look at it short term planning rather than very long range. And there are some predictions which Sean brought it out in order to say there are certain trends about which people will have to take positions, particularly for businessmen. So with that, uh, once again, I would like to thank the Richard, uh, Dr. Uzair and Pridaus Rosli and Sean for giving us your perspective. And this has been a very uh, illuminating kind of presentation, but overall we look at positively, but step by step rather than one quick jump because there is no one quick jump.